Hello, everybody. Welcome to the CNCF webinar about Fluembit and the upcoming release of Fluembit 1.9. My name is Eduardo Silva. I'm one of the creators and maintainers of this project called Fluembit. I'm also a lucky founder and CEO of this company called Calitia and has been a long time a CNCF maintainer and engaged with the community. In the past, I used to be a software engineer at Oracle and a principal engineer at Treasure Data. Before getting started with the news about Fluentbit 1.9, I'm sure that many of you are new about uh, Fluentbit. Some of you may come from around from the Fluentd ecosystem, or maybe you're just learning about login and metrics. So I will take some a few minutes and take a few slides to share some concepts about uh, Fluentbit and why uh, this is important. The first thing uh, that everybody has to remember that uh, we are a a CNCF project. We are a graduated project of the CNCF under the umbrella of FluentD. FluentD is a parent project uh, made original for logging, and FluentBit is a sub project of it, both and in a graduated states. One of the problems that FluentBit aims to solve pretty much like, like FluentD, we are from the same family, is like sometimes you have many data that comes from different sources and you want to do some data analysis, right? But when you're talking about distributed systems and we have uh, applications on bare metal servers or you have applications in, in Kubernetes, right? How do you extract all this information in a smooth way so you can perform your data analysis later, right? And when you do a data analysis, right? Pretty much some people like to aggregate the data into just one single place like Elastic or Kafka so they can have different subscribers to extract this information. So if you think about the complexity of having different sorts of information from different places plus different formats, you might think that you need a solution for this, and, and that is Fluentbit. And Fluentbit is a lightweight agent that is installed on-prem in your cluster, in your Kubernetes nodes, or just in your normal uh, VM or bare metal machines. And you can configure it to perform data collection from different sources like files, systemd, or just receive data from uh, the network like TCP or firewall messages over syslog. Having this uh, is really important, right? Um, because one of the challenges uh, sometimes as a developer is like build the application. Then the next stage is deploy the application, but after deploying this application, you need to monitor this application. And there are many areas to, to monitor an application or how to, so to instrument the application. Fluentbit, as of today, cares about two spaces of monitoring of, or observability. One of them is logs, which pretty much uh, takes information that the application uh, writes out to the standard output interface or to a log file or syslog, but also collect metrics from pretty much uh, any endpoint that this application can expose. Fluentbit uh, is, has been getting a lot of traction, uh, primarily, I would say, because of his performance and the low system resources usage, right? It's not the same something that a tool that is processing thousands of messages per second, consuming two, three gigabytes of memory in your system that has something that is consuming less than 100 megabytes, right? A, a, every megabyte counts, I would say. And as I said before, CNA, it's Fluentbit is a CNCF regulatory project under the umbrella of Fluentd. Now, getting a, a layer, getting more, the, doing a deep dive of the project, uh, Fluentbit is kind of an engine, right, that has support, different input source of information that could be logs, metrics that it takes them, it packages them as a binary representation and generate some internal events. Those internal events then could optionally go through a filter chain where this data can be enriched or can be modified. And one of these use cases is, for example, if you're running, a, I don't know, in AWS and you're processing a logs from X application, you would like to add some important information like not just application itself, but also where this application is running, what is the host name associated to that, the instance ID, the instance name, the zone where this was deployed. 
right? So all of these kind of modifications can be done uh, in a filter phase. After that, in the pipeline, we had this concept of buffering. As soon as we get the data, we filter it, we just store it temporarily, right? Even in memory or on disk, right? Because this data needs to be prepared to be delivered to multiple, one of multiple destinations. So buffering is really important because if you're going to send the data, many things could go wrong. One of them are DNS, they are network outages, uh, or sometimes your remote endpoint is down for a couple of minutes, couple of hours, and you don't want to lose your data, right? So we need this buffering in order to make sure that everything that you have in there will persist until you can send it. Of course, we provide mechanisms to say, I want to provide just a few gigabytes of data for buffering, but no more than that. Right? And in the output destination side is where we provide connectors for different backends, Kafka, Elasticsearch, OpenSearch, uh, Prometheus Remote Write. There are plenty of them. In general, we have around uh, 100 plugins between input filters and outputs. So Flowbit is a very versatile agent. Like we call it like a Swiss knife because it can be deployed in a Kubernetes cluster, in bare metal machine, or any kind of old system that you need to take your information out from it. Now, who's using Fluembit? Uh, nowadays, uh, Fluembit is used by all the major cloud providers. For example, if you go to Google Cloud and you deploy a Kubernetes cluster and you inspect what pods are running in your node, you will see that Fluembit is there. Same case for Microsoft, AWS has its own distribution of Fluentbit called AWS for Fluentbit, which comes with a specific connectors for AWS and more custom, um, not optimization, but custom setups for AWS customers. And so on, there are many, it's not just for cloud providers, right? We have many companies using it or integrating with it, even Splunk, New Relic, uh, LogDNA, Datadog. So, what is important here is that Fluentbit is a real vendor neutral solution, right? As a vendor neutral solution that we aim is like, allows you to deploy this and choose your vendor, your backend and switch to the next day to any backend that you want, right? It gives you the freedom to, to take your data, control your data and send it where you want today and give you the flexibility to change that destination tomorrow. Now about uh, Fluentbit updates, right? We have a, a lot of news to share. Actually, I'm pretty excited about this release and the whole team, community and companies working together on this release uh, has been tremendous work, right? And sometimes it's not just a code base. There are many areas and some of them we're going to discuss here in this webinar. One of them is like, the biggest news is like the success that uh, we just crossed the 1 billion deployments, yeah. right? If you go from our Docker Hub registry, and this is a huge accomplishment. I would say that uh, just few projects hit this or are runs at this scale, right? This took like a few years. And nowadays, uh, I would say that Fluent gets deployed 1 to 2 million times per day, which is insane. And of course, that means more traction, more bugs, more hands requests, but a bigger community. And that's what we aim for. As part of a development uh, process and a project, uh, sometimes it's not just to write code, right? We want to make sure that things uh, get right. So a few years ago, we get many complaints about uh, sometimes we push on future that break things or the, the lack of automation in the development workflow. Now, in the last year, uh, the, the community team has taken this seriously and have created a full automated test release process based on GitHub Actions. Right? Now we have staging builds, test process before to perform a release. Years ago, that did not happen, right? We just have uh, the code base, create a tag, create a tarball, push images, packages, and that's it. But now we have a full system that makes sure that every bit that we're going to ship out to users, customers from a company perspective, and partners is kind of certified and to avoid recreation. And we have any kind of, a lot of kind of testing, smoke testing for package installations. We are testing now if we need that one version and we upgrade to another one, the upgrade process do not fail. 
those kind of tests were not there before. And now they are with Fluembed 1.9. Now, all, um, all, if you're using containers, right, we just make sure to ship a lightweight container image. Lightweight, I mean that it's not in a big size that has a data that is not needed, right? For that, we choose Distroless what time ago. With Distroless, it's a kind of a container-based image that just contains what is needed. There's no shell, there's no external binaries that also can put a, some kind of security concern on your deployment. But this toilet was just in there for um, S86, well, 64 bits, right? But now we extended all the support of this toilet for all the architecture, which is ARM32 and ARM64 and x86. Now, when you're contributing to also to Fluent Bay, to GitHub submitting a PR, we have more than 30, 40 checks for that PR, running, running some LinkedIn, shell checks, actual lean, compiler version, and making sure that every contribution from the community will not break anything. And this goes from CentOS 7, which is a very old distribution, to the latest one, right? An old major distribution. And also we have integrated a new security system. So every time that we push an image or we're we are testing the development workflow, a new Im container image is created. Yeah, we are running a security scanning, trying to trap any kind of a problem like a CVE in an external library that we might be consumed or that is part of the distroless image. So I would say that this is brings a new, a new era on automation and making sure that things get right and you can go to sleep without problems, right? Once you deploy a new version. Uh, one of the other big things is like Fluentbed was a, has a very has used to had a very old archive uh, website. Uh, with the with the help and the sponsor with the community, we just could create a new website which is kind of, uh, for my my opinion, is kind of outstanding. Congrats to the Ari who's the designer of this website, and we create a website that is also continuing in the line that is open source and but the framework now it's in Hugo. It to be in Jekyll and Ruby, but now has been translated to Hugo, and this site is fully available in uh, the source code of it in GitHub. So if you are interested in contributing documentation, articles, uh, yeah, now we have all the pieces and the framework to provide uh, that feature set. Now let's get to the other fun part of this release, one that night. I'm sure that you wanted to know, hey, what's coming up? What are new features? What new things around? Okay, the first one is like we have implemented a new configuration mechanism. Actually, it's not a new. We refactored the whole configuration mechanism. So now we support not just the classic mode of Fluentb to configure in the pipelines, but also we support YAML, right? And, and you may be asking why YAML? Well, most of integration services or when you want to do a integration with APIs and make sure, or, or connect Fluentbed or deploy Fluentbed, the classic mode is not so friendly. It has a special indentation. Uh, it gets complex. When you go to the cloud native space where everything is YAML, yeah, Fluentbed was kind of more complex to manage. And we wanted to change that. Now we support YAML as like a native support, but also classic mode. So if you provided a YAML file, Fluentbed will work in the same way that in classic mode. Also, you can see here in the example that we have implemented the logical concept of pipeline. So you can separate things that uh, you might think that logically something that generated from some, some source with a tag will go, must go to a specific output, right? So, and sometimes we have found users that they have huge configuration with different logical pipelines, but all of them mix it together. Yeah, we wanted to fix that, and now you can define multiple pipelines. So when it's time to maintain your pipeline, it will be easier from any kind of perspective. And also from YAML perspective, we support includes, uh, we support that in Fluentbed for a long time, but we just make sure that when you provide a YAML file to Fluentbed, you can include other files in the case that you segment or you have more different pipelines to include. And this is always expected, performance, right? Uh, Fluentbed, as I said uh, some minutes ago, it's always, we care about, about performance, low memory footprint, 
but and not sacrifice uh, any resource, right? If you're going to use something massive, right, optimize it. Now, when the, the project started to grow, it started as a single thread pro problem, right? It's fully asynchronous, event-driven, and all what we want. But now when you have events for coming from network I.O., timers, scheduling, uh, waking up coroutines, right? Because we also run with coroutines, uh, you get these saturations of events in the main event loop, right? And AWS has done an outstanding job uh, analyzing how we can improve this, and they have contributed the concept of priority queues to Fluent Bay. And pretty much it's a, it's, it's a way to prioritize what kind of events that are being reported by the kernel needs to be processed first, mm -hmm. second, and in a third state. Mm -hmm. So for example, a, events that comes from the scheduler, or we need to flush a coroutine, or we need to dispatch, dispatch a task, and that is high priority. Those events reported will be processed first. Secondly, we will process all the network IO events. And this might be some confusing, but all the tests and all the CI integration shows that this has been the optimal way to increase even more the performance two, three times. And finally, yeah, everything that was about task initialization, when it's time to flush something and other normal events, yeah, they got the last uh, priority. And this has been a really, really good uh, improvement. So if you were surprised because Flambit can scale a lot, this will surprise you more. During, also talking about our performance, mm -hmm. in the, the last year in 2021, when we released Fluentbit 1.7, we implemented the concept of threading, right? As I said, we didn't have any threading. It was single thread, fully asynchronous with coroutines. We implemented this threading model in the output plugins. So everything that is about uh, converting the payload from message pack, which is an internal representation to, I don't know, an external JSON that is expected by Elastic and by Splunk, everything was being done in just one single thread. You can, you can imagine that that adds a lot of latency and delay things in the pipeline. So we created threads. We move all those expensive tasks to different threads. Right? Every thread can handle multiple coroutines, thousands. Right? And we just demonstrate that we can scale up even more the performance, so five times using a few threads. But this feature was not enabled by default. So the user has to go discover and put in the output section of a, of a config, say, workers one, workers two, or any kind of number that you wanted to scale. Uh, we found that this was not ideal. Uh, most of users were struggling uh, with performance. So we just changed the defaults. And for majority of the output plugins now runs uh, with a default number of threads. This is a very lightweight uh, thing. Uh, don't think that you're going to use double memory and three times memory. It's not like that. So most, for example, plugins like HTTP, STD out, files, Splunk, Elastic, OpenSearch, all of them now runs by default in separate threads. You can override that behavior. You can put worker zero and you should be fine but the defaults are optimal for majority of use cases. Yeah, everybody who wanted to know more about performance or wanted to hit uh, something higher, yeah, they can adjust the values without any problem. Now, let's talk about the input plugins. Mandando, we're going to prefix this input plugin with log input plugins, right? As I said, we are in the logs and metrics space. And shortly, we're going to jump into traces. So I'm going to describe a bit about the log input plugins that uh, what we have done on that area, right? Tail is the main plugin that allows you to follow files uh, from the file system, right? And every every six months, we found that users has more challenges. And some of them say, I have 50,000 50, files, but when Fluent Bits start, it's taken two, three minutes, right? We never thought that we were going to hit those use cases. So we optimized the Tail input plugin and now processing or to get started to process 50,000 files in just takes a few milliseconds, right? It's less than a second. So these kind of optimizations are quite, quite important. Uh, we have users that just tell files uh, tailing right, from the tail, but we have others that say, I want to process all the files that I have from the beginning, right? 
and this enhancement uh, try to fix that specific uh, use case. We had an issue like number 300, which is from 2017, if I'm not wrong, which is about asking for Kafka input plugin. Users wanted to have FluentB to behave as a Kafka subscriber, right? They were sending data to Kafka and they wanted to subscribe from it. So we just implemented, and I'm saying that now it's experimental because we are testing a new architecture for this plugin, right? And FluentBit went at nine chips with an input plugin for Kafka. This is quite a uh, working fine. And you can subscribe to many topics. You can get all your data in. And even we found some interesting cases where users are sending data to Kafka using FluentBet. And from the other side, they have another FluentBet consuming those, right? Doing a filtering, modif modifying this information and generating a new topic, right? So yeah, they're using also FluentBet as like a kind of stream processor for Kafka. And we're really happy about to hear about this use case because for us, stream processing has been always something really interesting where we can add a, a ton of value. And this is not about to replace Kafka, actually it's how to add more value to it. We have thousands of users connecting to Kafka and now this brings a new kind of level of uh, integration. For our Windows users, which are not a small amount, Actually, you, you might surprise that most of uh, financial institutions uh, just run 100,000 servers with Windows servers, right? And they, have, they face the same issue. How do I collect my information, my log information for my system? Uh, we used to have, and we still have, a plugin called WinLog, which allows you to get uh, the logs from the Windows event log system from Windows, but it was just uh, associated to classic channels. Now, the, this new plugin called Win EBT Log allows you to pull data, consume data from non-classic channels that you have uh, in your service. And we've got many companies and users expecting this implementation. I'm happy to say that it's already out uh, with 1.9. Now, let's jump to the filter plugins. This is not the full list. Uh, I'm just going to talk about one new filter that we have because uh, the re when I'm recording this, the release is happening just in a few days, and we are still have some more filters that we're going to add to this uh, release. The new filter is called Nightfall. Nightfall is a, is, a, is a vendor, it's a specific service that makes sure that if your records contains any sensitive information like API keys or PII, yeah, it can do data, data reduction on that and make sure that you're not going to ship any sensitive data. This is a third party service. This is a contribution for Nightfall to Flow and So thanks Nightfall for contributing this. And yeah, the, the filter is ready to go. Just go ahead to the documentation and you can start trying it out in this uh, service. Now in the output side for login, there's some news too. One of the biggest one is that the Fluent Bit project has partnered with the OpenSearch team, right? Uh, one of the missing pieces of OpenSearch, which is a fork from Elastic, is uh, the lack of an official agent for the users. Uh, from another angle also, our users, uh, some of them were migrating to OpenSearch. They had their own reasons. Um, but for us, being a vendor agnostic project, uh, framework agnostic and everything, it's like we want to make sure that our user has the possibility to switch to a different service, to a different project as a backend, but they have the right implementation as a connector for it. So Fluentbed has is shipping now a new open search connector based on the old Elasticsearch connector that allows you to have this kind of first class citizen connector for, for all our community. So if you're using open search, please switch to this new connector and uh, I'm sure you're going to get uh, a good experience with it. Other users, not others, thousands uh, use Fluentbit to send uh, data to S3 packets, to Amazon S3. And we got this really interesting use case. Uh, the data they were shipping is going to be consumed for analytics use cases. And they needed to have this in Apache Arrow. So a contribution from the company, their code, implemented all this Apache Arrow encoding for the S3 connectors. 
So thanks for that. So now if you rely on Apache Arrow and you want to use case is S3 buckets, you can do this with Fluentbed now. Now, another interesting angle, Fluentbed and Matrix. And um, we always get this question, what is Fluentbed uh, about metrics? What do we think about metrics? And part of the story is that when we started Fluentbed, one of the first plugins that we wrote for it, because that years ago for embedded Linux, was how to collect CPU metrics, disk IO metrics, and so on. But at that time, we handled all that information as structured blocks, not as a real matrix with a schema. But in, since one year ago, we started turning into implementing a native support for matrix payloads that allows Fluentbed to connect to other ecosystems. Okay? Our vision is like Fluentbed is like the core on all this ecosystem for observability. And we provide all the tooling, all the connectors that you are able to connect to different systems, different protocols, different frameworks, and also keep being vendor agnostic. And that, that's our mantra, keep being vendor agnostic and talk to everybody. So we look at this like a full embed, it's like an ecosystem where all these new frameworks, metrics, or instrumentations library or distributed systems can be connected through Fluentbed. Now, one of the new input plugins for metrics collection is the uh, Nginx plugin. The Nginx is quite an interesting plugin because Nginx, as a web, the Nginx web server, right, it ships uh, or can expose metrics in JSON format. So this new Nginx metric exporter plugin, what it does, it connects to this Nginx service, retrieve all the JSON payload, convert it to a metrics payload, and then it can process process it in the, our Fluent Bed pipeline and send it out to any kind of metrics endpoint. And not just Nginx, OSS, or open source, but also we support uh, the Nginx Plus version, which is an enterprise edition by Nginx. Another angle is that we talk about metrics logs, but now we are also able to collect metrics from Windows in a native way. Right now, this experimental plugin is able to collect CPU metrics uh, from the Windows system. And now during the one to nine release cycle, we're going to add other kind of um, metric samples, for example, disk, memory, storage, file system, and so on. So this is an ongoing work. And if you're interested in some special collector for Windows that is not there, please just open an issue on GitHub and we will try to prioritize it. If many people are interested in the same thing, right? Another interesting angle for, for metrics is like, in, in my personal vision, this is Eduardo talking, right? Uh, I see that the industry for, for monitoring or metrics space runs on Prometheus. That's a fact. And when Fluentbed started integrating with metrics, uh, the first approach is like for us is like to understand what are the challenges from the users. What are the challenges from fluent embedded users doing metrics collection with different agents, different systems? And we found many a lot of feedback that says, hey, I am using fluent embed, but also I'm deploying another kind of agent that does metrics scraping or collection. Why I cannot integrate the same functionality inside Fluentbed? And this is the result. As of today, and with this release, we got a, a new input plugin for Fluentbed, which is called Prometheus Scrape, that allows you to scrape metrics from your own applications or remote endpoints that expose a Prometheus information, Prometheus metrics. Right? In addition, and this is not new, but it was there, but we did a couple of enhancements right, in our Prometheus exporter, but that's in the output side, because with one side we can collect locally metrics, like uh, we have one plugin to collect node metrics, Windows metrics, but now when you're going to the output side, we can put that metrics in a Prometheus export format, so other services can scrape them, or if you want, you can use our 
another plugin called Prometheus Remote Right that allows you to take all these metrics and dispatch this metric to a third-party service, to a, to a Prometheus agent, or open telemetry collector, whatever is waiting for this kind of format. So we're really happy about uh, working together with the Prometheus, uh, Prometheus team, because this is not about separating things between logs, metrics, or traces, right? If you go to any kind of uh, production environment, you will find that most of technologies are there, different projects. There's no one single tool for everything, right? But all of them have uh, the same need, which is kind of integration. And Fluembit aims to solve that. The next really interesting topic is about open telemetry. We have get many questions about what is the FluentD and Fluembit position against open telemetry. And I would like to take this space to, to make some clarifications. Uh, for us, it never has been, never, one project against other. If I, told, if I talk about, for example, Fluent Story, when Elasticsearch was a, the, def the default backing for logs in the open source, and Logstash was kind of the competitor for FluentD, we got a bunch of users integrating with FluentD. We, made, we built plugins for Logstash, for Beats at that moment. So everything is about to provide the user the flexibility to solve the problem that they have. It's not about to replace technology. And for us, when we talk about open telemetry, we see this vision of a oh, unified framework for telemetry. And for us, yeah, it looks great. But now we have a responsibility. We have thousands of users. And a big part of them, maybe we jump into open telemetry. So now how do we extend our scope to support this journey for them jumping into open telemetry? So on Fluentbit 1.9, we are launching our first connector for open telemetry. One of them is open telemetry input that as of today is just a, to support metrics over OTLP. And during the release cycle of 1.9, we're going to add support for traces, right? In the output side, now we support only metrics, but the same story as in the input side, we're going to ship, a, be able to ship traces. And you might be asking, oh, does it mean that you embed a replace open telemetry collector? Um, I would say there will be many uh, features that are going to overlap with one to each other. But our intention is that the user get the flexibility to integrate all their systems. Right? Uh, we have seen the, in the production, we have seen with even with, co with customers from a company perspective, that switching telemetry, switching agents, uh, is not something that happens from one day to the other. Sometimes it takes one to two years. But from our standpoint, we want to make sure that we solve the problem today, but also we open the door for the integration to where the market wants to standardize. Right? And this is really interesting. And we're really happy uh, as a fluent project, we're going to start participating more in open telemetry. Uh, already, we are talking with our, uh, from a company perspective, with partners, understanding what they are the needs because they are using Fluent, but they are also jumping to open telemetry, and there are many gaps that they want uh, to fix for their own specific use case. So, if you want to talk about open telemetry, yeah, we are really happy to say that we are jumping into it. We are supporting and embracing open telemetry to make sure that also that project can succeed. We are both part of the CNCF and. Yeah, this is just an uh, interesting journey, the observability. So Fluentbit, it's something that aims to be around all the observability space, metrics, logs, and traces. Uh, right now, our primary focus, I would say that will be metrics and traces for this year. And as I said at the beginning, we want that Fluentbit becomes to be part of this central neural network where we can take any kind of payload or connect scrape information and deliver a high quality format for a different destination that is expecting that. So you might hear about a lot of about these kind of implementations, uh, POCs and things running in production already. But uh, we will be really happy to hear from you about your use case, even concerns or anything that we can add as a, as a value to the project. 
Well, that was uh, the quick webinar, the quick presentation about Fluent 1.9. I'm sure that many things could happen in a few days when when you see the release. I'm recording this on a few days before we are, uh, you know, putting the live stream for this. But if you have any questions, please feel free to write me an email. I will be happy to sync, jump into a Zoom call. I'll also, a reminder that we have our Fluembed community community calls every two weeks. You can find the information on our flu in the website fluembed.io. Okay. Thanks so much for attending. Enjoy your day, your evening, your night, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you.